Just a heads up, this video discusses topics like trauma, suicidality, abuse, death, murder, and other violent acts. If you want to sit this one out, that's okay. If not, please proceed cautiously. Of course, take your own mental health into account during the video. If it gets to be too much, that's okay. I'll see you in the next one. But with that, let's go into the introduction. The Phantom of the Opera is a tale that has been massively commercially successful for over 30 years. This story is one of romance, pain, superstition, and trauma. Did you know, however, that this story is much older than the musical that so many are familiar with? In its original form, back in 1909, this story was published by French author and journalist Gaston LaRue in the newspaper La Galois from September 1909 to January 1910. This was published as a book in its original French not long after, in either February or March of 1910. Sources seemed to differ. The narrator insisted that the Phantom of the Opera was real. Given that the story is woven with slightly altered real-life events, it is well believed. Much like how this is based around real events, LaRue is also alright with portraying human emotions. Though I'm not versed enough with French to view his journalism pieces, I have a strong feeling that his dealings with people as a journalist helped this aspect of writing. Since this channel has such a focus on mental health, and considering how much I love The Phantom of the Opera, I figured it would be a great topic to talk about. Mental health in Gaston LaRue's Phantom of the Opera. Please note that all quotes will be taken from the Muriel Riviere translation of Phantom of the Opera. This is not because it's a great translation or anything, it's just what I had lying around when I started researching for this video. Let's move to the first factor, to the main trio's mental health. But before touching on Christine, Raoul, or the Phantom, I think it best to speak about their environment. Society, for example. So, let's take that example of society mentioned earlier, and run with it. Even in the first paragraphs of the novel, superstitions are mentioned with many characters. In the very first line of dialogue, Sorelli is heard referring to the opera ghost, a source of fear and many superstitious action among the ballet girls. Even before her first line of, silly little fool, Sorelli is said by the narrator to be superstitious. She carries a St. Andrew's cross ring with her, as well as keeping a horseshoe on the table by the concierge's lodge, which she insists on having everyone working at the opera touch before ascending the staircase. Along with this, a young dancer called Little Jams has a coral amulet, which she touches to ward off bad luck. Joseph Bouquet, said to be a machinist, is privy to and only furthers talk of these superstitions like the ghost. These silly superstitions are often spoken of in theatre troupes in real life. Take, for example, the popular Macbeth superstition. Many people in the theatre warn against saying Macbeth three times in theatre, with some even refusing to perform the play itself. I feel that another of these superstitions, which has been well woven into the fabric of the story with the Phantom of the Opera, is the character of the Persian. The ballet girls are quite afraid of this quiet Iranian man who lurks around the opera. It is said that the Persian possesses the evil eye. This is a well-known source of ill luck. The variety that it seems, by even speaking of the bearer, is feared to bring about the curse. At least, the chorus girls seem to think so. They ward off this curse by making a symbol like devil horns. Or, I interpret it like an old-school rock and roll kind of sign, but same dip, I suppose. It seems that those in the opera are quite willing to blame either the opera ghost or the Persian for any troubles they may come across, whether it is their fault or not. However, the opera ghost is, by far, the figure that gets the most blame. Let's pause on that for a bit, though. First, we have a few characters to talk about before we can get to the Phantom of the Opera. I'm going to start with a character that few fans seem to know about, especially if they are only familiar with the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical. This character, despite having lived in Paris for seemingly a few years now, is still one cloaked in an air of mystery. He lurks quietly around the opera house, his motives unknown. He is known around the opera as the Persian. Now, maybe it's just me, but this does come off as a bit strange. If I was hanging out somewhere a lot, I'd probably get kind of tired of being called only by my nationality. 
even when he isn't being called the Persian, his frenemy, the Phantom of the Opera, calls him by his profession. Or should I say his previous profession, Daroga. According to author Gaston LaRue, Daroga means chief of police in Persian. If you were close enough to somebody to follow them in their escape from the country in order to make sure that they didn't get into too much trouble, wouldn't you be on a mutual first name basis? And don't give me any, oh, it would be too hard to pronounce crap either. We need to do better than that. If being generous, then have the Persian give a name that is pronounceable by a French audience. I feel like that would take a mental toll. Constantly answering to your nationality and old job title like, is that the Canadian? Or be careful, auto mechanic. The man is literally living on a pension. He's at retirement age, for goodness sake, and he's spending his time trying to look after a man who has caused him harm and sent him away from any family or future he had. I know that Iranian politeness, tarov, is something that seems to stretch quite far, especially for those who aren't familiar with the custom, but following a friend to another country just to keep tabs seems like a little bit much. Yes, I'm sure there's probably a better term for this than tarov, but my knowledge of Persian customs or language only goes so far. And yes, I know that the Persian isn't exactly on good terms with Persian royalty after helping his friend escape, instead of following orders and executing him, but I feel that this furthers my incredulity at the Persian's actions. Yes, this banishment explains why the Persian is referred to by nationality, especially in narration, potentially to hide his identity. But I still don't believe that the Phantom and the Persian weren't on a mutual first name basis. The Persian repeatedly refers to the Phantom as Eric, which the Phantom seems to be fine with, so I question the repeated use of the title Daroga. It is interesting to me that the Persian waits so long to consider turning Eric into the authorities. On one hand, I could see it as being almost an act of self-preservation, should word get back that Eric is truly not dead, and the Persian failed, especially despite chasing him across Europe. It could cause a lot of trouble. However, given his strained relations with the Shah because of Eric, I find it especially interesting that the Persian takes it upon himself to serve as Eric's conscience. I feel all of this mental pressure that could be attributed to all of this could take quite a toll on a person. This is, of course, not even taking into account any and everything that the Persian witnessed while as an officer in Iran. All of this doesn't really get explored. I think that because of Gaston LaRue's time as a journalist, even the chapters, no, not passages, full-on chapters of the Persian's own viewpoint fails to delve into the emotions of the character. While LaRue does excuse this, saying that the character intended to submit these documents to the authorities to incriminate Eric, I still find it strange. Compared to the other point-of-view characters, who we will delve into soon, the Persian chapters seem pretty cut and dry, other than a few waxings about Persia and the harm Eric caused there back in the day. Despite his concern for Eric, he otherwise is portrayed as methodical, perhaps even cold. Even while talking with the Viscount Raoul de Chagny, the Persian maintains his level-headed appearance. He does show relative patience with the rather clueless Viscount when it comes to matters like Eric's Punjab lasso, and though he doesn't walk the Viscount through his thought processes, so to say, he does take care in the follow-through so that, as much as possible, no harm will come to their party of two. Even when harm does befall them in their descent into the Phantom's torture chamber, as well as the mental and physical toll this torture takes on them, the Persian is still aware enough of the Phantom's tricks to set to work against them as soon as he discovers that he and his companion are in the chamber. I find it interesting that even through the fog of heat-induced delirium, the Persian is still able to work through the tricks of the chamber, though I feel this could be written off through police training and both his awareness and caution when around Eric due to his frenemy's actions in Persia or Iran. I do think that it was his familiarity with Eric and his tricks that saved the Persian, both physically and mentally, from succumbing to Eric's tricks. This set of circumstances is most unlike the next character we'll be talking about, the man stuck in the middle of seemingly every dynamic in this story, the Viscount Raoul. De Chagny. Raoul is a character we get to know quite well throughout this story. Unfortunately, his tragedy starts quite young, with his mother's passing in childbirth. 
This causes him to basically be raised by a nanny and his brother, Philippe. As a child, he meets the love of his life, Christine Daae. He grows close to her and her father, even taking violin lessons from Monsieur Daae before Monsieur Daae's death. He grew up going around door to door with Christine in hopes that a stranger would bless some small children with an interesting story. Upon being forced to part ways, Raoul is still very in love with Christine, to the point that he goes in search of her when she faints on stage at the start of the novel. He is noticeably distraught when Christine seemingly ignores his existence and friendship upon waking up from her painting spell. After eavesdropping on Christine's conversation with a mysterious man who professes deep love for her, Raoul discovers that the voice can seemingly disappear. He is not about to give up on being with the girl he has loved since childhood. Instead, he follows Christine to the coast side of Perot, where Christine's agitation with Raoul and her streak of ignoring him continues. This coastal town is a place of, I feel, a fairly significant trauma for Raoul. He almost freezes to death in the middle of the night, passing out after seemingly being taunted by animated skulls in the graveyard he followed Christine to in the dead of night. This near-death experience, along with other events that will be explored presently, seems to have a lasting effect on the Viscount. After all, who wouldn't be at least a little bit spooked by skulls who have flaming eyes that laugh at you in a dark, otherwise abandoned graveyard? After he gets back to Paris, Christine's continued streak of ignoring him really affects him. It even brings Raoul to the brink of suicide. The thing that pulls him out of this mindset is a letter he receives from Christine. In the novel, his obsession with Christine seems to read as over the top, perhaps even childish. This could be because in society, we do not like men to be soft, to cry often, which Raoul does in the book. A lot. But honestly, the Viscount de Chagny has gone through a lot up to this point in the book, and it's only part way through. Now, this letter is an invitation to attend a masquerade ball with Christine, wanting to see the love of his life again. Raoul agrees to meet her there. What he doesn't expect at this ball, however, is to see costumes that trigger that fresh trauma from the graveyard. Obviously, it seems that Raoul's instinct is to fight not to fly, freeze, or fawn upon seeing a mask that reminds him of those chortling skulls. It takes a lot of insistence from Christine not to chase after it. His fight response doesn't end there, as he berates Christine for stopping him from going after the man, who Christine confirms is the one who has been teaching her, her angel of music. Soon after this masquerade ball, his love, Christine, is kidnapped on stage, leaving Raoul once again feeling helpless and distraught. He soon finds that she has returned to the residence she lives in with Madame Valerius. When meeting up with Christine, he is shocked at her insistence that the angel of music isn't real. Overall, this seems to be a recurring pattern for Raoul. When Christine is away from him, it really breaks Raoul mentally, to the point of suicidality and possible delusion. For example, an instance that a cat spotted outside Raoul's apartment is secretly Christine's kidnapper, Eric. Upon another kidnapping, a final kidnapping of Christine, Raoul finally decides to team up with the Persian. This is far from the end of Raoul's trauma. He is trapped, undergoing heat-induced delusion in Eric's torture chamber and of the opera house. Due to these delusions and the fact that Christine was once again held from him, I believe that this, along with the near-death experience of being present in what was basically an explosion threat, that the experience was very traumatic. These threats were only compounded by the trauma of his brother's death not long after these events. Overall, Raoul has been dealt a very difficult hand. He deals with difficult situations by fighting and crying. This seems to be similar to the next character we'll be taking a look at, Christine. At the first scene we see with Christine, there are already potential red flags regarding the mental health of this poor girl. She fakes not being able to recognize her childhood friend and insists that she is well, despite having just completely lost consciousness on stage. This to stop any potential problems with her abuser, who is there unseen by anyone. These problems seem exacerbated by her father's beliefs, which seems strongly held. Her belief that her late father sent her an angel of music was just as steadfast. Her willingness to blindly accept that an unseen voice was otherworldly and more than willing to help her career, ended up ultimately being a huge setback, to say the least. Christine's apparent need for another father figure in her life 
after the loss of her last remaining birth parent, is taken advantage of quite heavily when being tricked into believing in the appearance of this angel of music. In my notes, I labeled her actions in calling the voice her father delusional. However, considering that the voice was a man who played to these very beliefs, fed into and furthered them, I don't entirely know what to say in any case. Once these beliefs are challenged by her love Raoul, she is angered. This response is understandable and fairly common as she clings to her belief, denying its non-existence, the belief being strengthened when she hears the voice in the graveyard she came to visit her late father in, where her father's violin is played strengthening this connection between the voice and her father. Not long after returning from Peru, Christine vanishes from the public eye again, having her beliefs in the angels strengthened once more by Madame Valerius, who seems to be just as superstitious as her late father was. When this absence occurs, it seems that her abusive relationship with the voice deepens when Christine is forbidden from marrying, lest the voice of her abusive angel vanish forever. Christine is pretty smart at reading between the lines about this new restraint. She sends a note to Raoul to meet her at the upcoming masquerade ball. Despite this, she's obviously still very anxious about being found out, as well as when this is once again challenged by Raoul. It basically takes everything in her to stop Raoul from stalking her abuser and beating the crap out of him, as it becomes evident that even Christine's career is being controlled by the voice but she says little else lest her complaints be heard. So she stays anxious, depressed, and sad about her situation throughout the course of the ball, still holding fast to the same beliefs held at the Paro churchyard. Of course, the pattern continues, and Christine is kidnapped again. However, this is when the pattern breaks. When Christine comes back, she no longer believes that the voice is the angel of music. Her anxiety increases even more after her beliefs were shattered. Considering this means that she has to re-examine beliefs that she once felt safe with, this is understandable. It is understandable that, at this time, she states that she is unable to recognize who she was before. This being said, she is uncertain if she will be able to find the willpower to leave her abuser. She admits to being in a dreamlike state, associating the angel with her father's memory. And, honestly, with what she says next, I'm not sure whether to attribute that to the effects of drugs or potential dissociation. Maybe a bit of both. She explains feeling terrified throughout and after the first kidnapping. She was astounded at the revelation that the angel of music wasn't an angel, but a man, weeping at this discovery. She realized soon after that her abuser, Eric, was holding her captive. Her response, which reads like a sort of mental defense against accepting her situation, was both to laugh and to cry. She admitted that she was willing to commit suicide if Eric crossed any moral lines. Thankfully, it seems that although tensions were high, singing could be used as a way to release emotions. That didn't last too long. Of course, discovering that her kidnapper wore a mask it is natural that curiosity would kick in. She is human, after all. What she saw under that mask, and what Eric did afterwards, was the cause for what could be a PTSD-like response. This abuse only magnified once Christine saw Eric's face. Once again, Christine was nearly driven to suicide. Instead, she faked happiness and positivity in order to f convince Eric to free her. Each interaction with her abuser brought more fear. All this for two weeks. Then she escaped. So after all this trauma, what comes next except for a finale of more trauma? Of course, having been through Raoul's side of the story, we kind of know what's coming. Eric forces her to be responsible for the lives of everyone in the opera house. Through the scorpion and the grasshopper. After kidnapping her for the climax of the story. Naturally, her brain goes, nope, this is too much to cope with, and once again opts to try suicide instead of either marrying her abuser or killing, blowing up the whole Paris opera. Because, you know, no pressure or anything. 
When Eric sees her literally pounding her head against a wall in an attempt to die, he binds her hands and feet to a chair, leaving her with the same choice of abusive marriage or mass death. When she finds out that Raoul and the Persian are in the torture chamber, she tries desperately to save them, covering for them when Eric comes back and suspects their presence. Eric doesn't fall for her trick and tells her that Raoul might die in the chamber. At that, she faints. She then, with a lot of negotiation, convinces Eric to free Raoul and the Persian. In exchange for their freedom, she sacrifices hers. During her marriage to Eric, she remains completely silent. It isn't certain whether this was just depression or if it was to protect herself, Raoul, and the Persian. I have a feeling it was both. At some point, near the end of the story, Eric releases the three of them with the promise that Christine would return to bury him. So, what Eric left her and Raoul with is what basically amounts to a boatload of trauma. Unfortunately, they aren't the only ones that were left with a ton of trauma. So, let's move on to the last character we'll be covering today, Eric. Now, on to one of the characters who, although easy to talk about at first, is just as complex as the others. Of course, we will call him by his name, Eric. However, it is a common conjecture that this may be a name he chose in order to get closer to Christine, given its Scandinavian origin but he states it was given by accident. Eric's childhood is not spoken much within the novel, barely even touching upon his time outside of what happens in the novel itself. However, it could be theorized that at least some of the issues that we will be touching upon here manifested in Eric's childhood. It is seen within his first appearance that Eric's very comfortable in silence, often sneaking up upon others, not making himself known. He's content to listen to his surroundings. When he does speak, he often uses ventriloquism. I believe that this is really just another way, along with his mask, to hide. This way, along with sneaking up on people, he does not need to interact with others face to face, having only to throw his voice from behind closed lips in order to communicate. This being said, I wonder if it could be argued that he was not taught to be literate beyond the level of what is often quoted to be a child. His handwriting is quoted to be childlike and disjointed, along with the fact that when Eric first who himself, he speaks in the third person. Often, Eric plays tricks on people, such as his games with the opera managers in order to receive his monthly allowance. In other examples, he uses drugs in order to play out these tricks. In order to kidnap Christine from the stage, he drugs the lighting man in order to have the lights flicker once to reveal Christine's disappearance from the stage at the climax of the book. Perhaps these tricks are a way to regain a youthful trickster persona from childhood? At least, that is the way I often read it. Eric has stated to the Persian an aversion or rejection to taking responsibility for these tricks especially when faced with the consequences, like with the falling of the chandelier. I find that this lends itself well to the theory of reclaiming lost childhood mischief. Eric is also quick to anger, especially in regards to the removal of his mask, and things not going according to his plans. While he could have come across this naturally, as I could see his parents having a similar reaction to his bared face, which he could be emulating. I think this anger could be somewhat of a defense, believing that if people are driven away by his facial deformity, he could hasten that rejection by making people flee from his anger. It could also just be that he is frustrated at the constant fear and mockery of his looks. This is backed up by Eric repeatedly saying that he longs to be like anyone else. It is that sentiment of wanting to be like anyone else that makes him insecure in his love for Christine. Love is physical for Eric, being about holding someone close, kissing them, etc. These two in particular are huge for Eric. This could be due to restricted physical contact that he received as a child. His insecurity led to him drugging Christine in order to meet her really face-to-face -face and show her his home underneath the opera house. That being said, 
he maintains a boundary that he will not tell Christine that he loves her without her giving her consent. He often falls to his knees weeping, wishing not to harm her, but that she could love him. Not that this denies or diminishes in any way all of the harm that he has done up to and beyond this point. He knows that without initially forcing her, he has little chance of receiving her love. This has led to ultimatums that he has given Christine, which amount to love me and don't abandon me or I will take away what you care about. Again, I wonder if this relates to his childhood, as Eric states that his mother could not bear to look at him and his childhood, the physical love that he cherished, was taken from him as he was presumably forced to grow up on his own, abandoned. With that being said, Eric does still hold a fondness for his mother, and that he claims to have kept her furniture. Having this physical reminder of his mother that he seems to cherish tells me that he doesn't despise her or anything like that. This could also relate to why he seems to never eat or drink around people. This will make sense, I promise. The fear of abandonment could pretty easily be a big source of anxiety. I wonder if this could be around the idea of being rejected by people. A sort of rejection anxiety. This could be an explanation for why he doesn't eat or drink anything when around people. It could be that by someone potentially seeing even a part of his face, he believes that this will lead to further rejection. Eric also holds what I'm going to call a deep obsession with death. Yes, even beyond the claims that he bears a death's head, or a rather macabre, skull-like face. Eric is still further obsessed about ideas of death, beyond his self-degradation of calling himself a corpse. He also owns a coffin, and uses it as a bed to sleep in at night, stating that one must get used to everything, even eternity. He is painfully aware that his deformity, his body temperature, which Christine notes as being cold, and the odor he emits. Again, Christine is the one to comment that his hands smell like death. In his obsession, Eric also seems quite calm about the whole concept. I wonder if this is, in part, due to the part he played in Iran, as a sort of executioner, as the inventor of a torture chamber, and someone who uses a lasso as a deadly weapon. From what was stated by the Persian, it is presumable that Eric spent a lot of time in the Middle East as entertainment for the morbid little sultana, who much enjoyed the ways which Eric invented to kill people, often prisoners. This extended time creating ways to murder others is probably a big factor in Eric's insensitivity to the suffering and death of others. I'm also curious and rather unsure what quite to make of Eric's writing and composing sessions in his aim to write his opera Don Juan Triumphant. He tells Christine that once in a while he works at it day and night for two weeks at a stretch, during which his music is his sole sustenance, and then he lets it rest for several years. I don't know if it's mania, considering it happens so seldomly, but he seems driven in his goal to complete his operatic score, so much that he has the energy to go upwards of two weeks without food, drink, or, I'd imagine, much sleep. Honestly, none of what has been written here sounds particularly healthy, mentally or physically. But let's move on to the next section, as otherwise I'm delving into a long rabbit hole of dreadful specifics, with details that I feel leave a lot to be desired when it comes to Eric. Overall thoughts. These characters are, honestly, walking balls of stress and trauma, along with a host of other issues. As stated at the start of this project, I am not a mental health professional. I know this video might seem like I promote it, but I do not condone armchair diagnoses. All I'm saying is that, much like the characters in other works of fiction, which this is, no matter how much 13-year-old me wanted to believe otherwise, these characters need a few boatloads of therapy for their boatloads of trauma. There was a lot of terrible things, horrifying things, that these characters went through in a fairly short time frame. I feel like a lot of people discuss things like this about, say, the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, 2004 movie adaptation included. But fewer people discuss, let alone know, or really think about the novel by Gaston LaRue that started it all. 
According to the Phantom of the Opera website, focused solely around the Weber stage production, over 140 million people have seen the show across 33 countries. If that kind of notoriety could occur for the Liru novel, I think that would be amazing. But anyways, I could talk about the Phantom of the Opera for hours, but it would go outside of the scope of this video. If you have any more topics about mental health or LGBTQIA things that you would like to see covered, please let me know down in the comments below. As always, resources are listed in the description. Thanks for watching the OCD MB. Stay safe out there.